one of the six LaRouche Democrats for U.S. Congress, and it is a little peculiar. You heard what he said about party, because in a sense what we're doing is we're, we're organizing way beyond party. We're way over party. There is no party. What there is is the Patriots versus the Tories. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing, and the six of us myself and my colleagues who are in Washington State, California, Michigan, Massachusetts, and Texas um, are the leadership. We have to function as the actual Congress, as the Congress should function. Now this week is a really, really big week in history. Um, Monday and Tuesday, the events that occurred those two days, which I will review, will prove to be a turning point, not just for the United States, but for civilization. Either they're going to be the inflection point at which the American people woke up, shook off their concrete slumber that's deadened their brains for the last 30 or 40 years and decided to defend the nation, or it's the turning point at which we descend into a dark age which will take generations from which to recover. What occurred is that Obama and Geithner had been in Ill illegal collusion with David Beers of Standard & Poor's for some time. There were actually thousands of emails exchanged. And what was done, and it reminds me, I don't know how, how many people here have seen the Shakespeare play Measure for Measure, or are familiar with the play? <laughs> Because in that play, and I forget all the details, but basically what happens is there's this couple who have fornicated, and the young man is, gonna, is in prison. He's going to be executed. And the guy who's ordering the execution says if, to the, the lover of this young man that if she will just spend the night with him, that the guy will not be executed. So what they arrange is that there's another young lady who actually is in love with this nasty old man. So she disguises herself as the one he really wants to sleep with. She goes and <coughs> spends the night with him. And so the next morning, of course, the deal was that the prisoner is supposed to be released and his life is to be spared. But lo and behold, he decides to execute him anyway. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's when you're dealing with the British Empire, when you're dealing with Standard and Poor's and Moody's, why would you expect that you had a deal, just like Leandra said? Mm -hmm. So what happened, of course, is that they, Obama, whatever, was promised, you know, and he used the threat of default like Cheney and Bush used 9-11. We're going to default, we're going to default, you have to do this, you have to do this, or we're going to default and they're going to downgrade us, and you have to do this. So it was a terror campaign on the Congress to say, if you don't agree to cut $4 trillion from the budget, which was their figure, then there's going to, we're going to be downgraded. There's going to be a default. Now, first of all, how many people in the Congress think that they're going to be reelected if they call for eliminating Social Security and Medicare? So the Congress doesn't think that that's a really good election campaign strategy. Bush tried privatizing Social Security. That didn't work. And people aren't all that enthusiastic about it now. Um, so what they agreed to do is to cut $2.5 trillion. And then they, they arranged this really <coughs> fascist deal. And I'll go through later the, the precedent, which was what, what the German parliament did under Hitler with the Reichstag fire. But basically, what was worked out is they're going to cut, there's $1.2 trillion in cuts that go through right away. Then, in order for the Congress to wash their hands of the deal, they agreed, and the House and Senate both passed this, to establish a super Congress. It sounds a little like Ubermensch. There's a reason for that, the Uber Congress. 12 Democrats, 12 Republicans, some from the House, some from the Senate. And what they're going to do is come up with another $1.5 trillion in cuts, which is not all the cuts. That's just the beginning of the cuts. So when they tell you it's over 10 years, 
that's not all they're going to do. The figures they're throwing around are insane. It's like $6 trillion, $10 trillion. At any rate, they're going to come up with the initial $1.5 trillion in cuts. Then their decision goes to the House of Representatives for a vote. No filibuster, no amendments, no debate is allowed. It's either yay or nay. If the House votes nay on the $1.5 trillion in cuts, they will be cut anyway. Okay, and this is the way that the Congress protect themselves and can be reelected because they say, well, I voted no. I voted no. I didn't vote for these cuts except they set up the whole mechanism exactly so it could be done and they could have a distance from it. So that's what was voted on. That's why on Monday of last week, LaRouche, uh, those of us who are organizers know we got a phone call around 11 o'clock in the morning and we were told we are putting the whole national organization on a mobilization, get to your Congress, we cannot allow this to pass. This is a fascist decision. It is not, where in the Constitution does it say super Congress? It's not there. We have a representative government, supposedly. That's what's in the Constitution. So we went into a total mobilization and, you know, it wasn't a unanimous vote. Interestingly, uh, 95 Democrats voted against Obama. Um, so that was interesting. And in the Senate, uh, it was really horrific. I forget what it was, something like 74 to 26, really pathetic. Uh, of interest, the two New Jersey senators voted against the Nazi bill. So I think our campaign may be having some effect in that state. Uh, they might be afraid they're going to get the Christie treatment from me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so what I wanted to do is to give you a sense here of not just why this is fascist, which it is, but why the policy itself will destroy civilization. And what I'm going to start with, I hope you'll, you'll uh, bear with me, is um, we're going to discuss the difference between human beings and animals. Because unfortunately nowadays, <laughs> uh, people don't seem to really know that. Or it's revolutionary to discuss it. Okay. So here's one thing, well, you can say human beings take care of their young. Well, guess what? Birds take care of their young. So that might not be the distinction. <laughs> then the next. We build houses. Well, so do beavers. <laughs> Very nice ones, by the way. They're quite nicely designed. Okay, then next. We plan for the future. So do the squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. Now the cheetah, we can run, but the cheetah is a lot faster than we are. So that may not be what defines us. Next. We have a sense of smell, but his sense of smell is a lot better than ours. Okay, next. Now they have very elaborate electromagnetic guidance systems in their beaks and they can determine direction for which we need a GPS. <laughs> so clearly that's not our identity. Next. Uh, they live longer. <laughs> Next. They're stronger. <laughs> and the last you say, well look, at least Americans are intellectual. We go to school. Yeah. Guess what? They're in school. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so the question is, all right, so what is it to be human? Maybe I can have this on part where you can still see. You can still see the fish, right? You can still see it, yeah. Anyway, so what is it? Well, the environmentalist movement, the green movement, would tell you, well, actually, human beings are a lot worse than animals. Human beings destroy the planet. Human beings do horrible things that no animal ever do, does. And I guess these people have never actually watched those shows that I used to watch when I was a kid where you'd see the animals like ripping each other apart and eating each other. I mean, you know, <laughs> I guess they never saw that. Anyway, um, but really, the, the actual distinction of a human being 
and you'll see that there are certain concrete empirical measurements of this, is that the human, human beings are the only living creature that are creative and that are willfully creative. That is, the universe itself is creative. And everything in the universe functions towards that creativity. But human beings can choose to be creative at will. And not only that, we can actually change the future. We can change the future for the human race and for the planet. And I'm not going to go through this here, but if you follow on our website, what, what's actually coming into view, which is tremendously exciting, is actually, were it not for human beings, it may be the case that the entire planet already would have gone dead. Because it's part of the nature of the way the biosphere develops to become more and more and more highly ordered, more and more energy dense just like mammals have to consume about 10 times the amount of calories per pound of body weight that reptiles do. And that's natural, and we're higher order. So the environmentalists might propose that maybe we should have a movement to go back to being reptiles. <laughs> <laughs> so you can call the herd, only the people with the scaly skin get to procreate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So anyway, now let's look at this, because you're going to see what I mean on the next graphic, which is really fascinating. See this little teensy thing? And right here, that's around 1400, the Black Death, that little bit, 1300. But then look, this is population growth of human beings on the planet. Now, if deer did that, they would starve to death. They would eat up all their food and you'd just have disease and they'd all starve and they'd destroy the environment. With human beings, the, the, it's very interesting because the question is, what's the standard of living for a human being, say, a few thousand years ago, compared to a human being today? Is our standard of living higher or lower? Well, <laughs> how many people think this guy had an easier life than you do? You know, the life expectancy might have been like 30, 25, had to go out and hunt. Who knows when they even figured out how to cook their food. I mean, not pleasant. Next. Now, you can have food on the train <laughs> delivered to you. And unfortunately, it just shows how primitive we are. I could not find, I wanted to find a really fancy, fancy dining car on a maglev train. <laughs> but I couldn't <laughs> find a picture of that. But anyway, you can imagine. So um, this is really fascinating because what you see with human beings is not only do we have more and more people at an exponential rate of growth, but that the standard of living of those more people is far higher than the standard of living of when we had less people. And this is exactly what I thought, and I was really happy to find it. The black curve, which goes like this, that's energy consumption per capita. The red curve is population. So isn't that fascinating? Each person consumes, because guess what? Before FDR's Rural Electrification Administration, those people out on the farms did not consume any electricity because they didn't have it. And then when they got electricity, what that meant is, for example, light, I think light bulbs have a great, you can double the amount of times in a day that a chicken will lay its eggs by using light. So you can multiply the amount of food that you're producing. If you have refrigeration, you can store the food so it doesn't go bad. So what happened is by bringing electricity to the farms, you actually increased by orders of magnitude what you could produce. Now that's interesting because what's the line of the greens? The line of them is that, well, population grows geometrically, but resources only grow arithmetically. And what you discover is, no, actually it's because of human creativity, our resources actually explode and grow exponentially just as population does, but you have to have an economy that is committed to that. So what happened is we got electricity to the farmhouses, they began using electricity, so people 
use many orders of magnitude of electricity more than your parents did. And that's good. And what you hear, the reason I've been fighting so hard in New Jersey on this um, energy master plan, people have heard of that, we went through it last week and I showed my testimony at the hearings. See, the reason you know it's a genocidal plan is that the so-called energy master plan says you should reduce your consumption. Well, if you reduce your consumption, guess what? You saw the caveman? And how many people can you sustain if you're living like a caveman? Well, one, one you know, barbarian might need a few square miles just to find enough insects and berries or whatever the heck they're going to eat. So all of a sudden, instead of having 1,200 people per square mile like we have in New Jersey right now, maybe you can only have one person per five square miles. So you're just going to have mass extermination. So any, all these people say, conserve energy, reduce consumption, reduce consumption. What they're calling for is to go to a dark age. They are proposing a dark age. And they might as well start lobbying that we should go backwards and become reptiles and amphibians. And maybe we should go back farther and become single-celled plankton. They probably wouldn't like that, though, because even the plankton convert sunlight through pho photosynthesis and produce oxygen. They'll probably tell you oxygen is a pollutant. I mean, you know, it's, it's really. So you have to think. Leander had done a video where she said that people couldn't fight fascism if they believed in the environmentalist movement, if you believe in solar panels and windmills, you will not be able to stop fascism. Well, this is why, because what you're contributing to, if you're supporting solar panels and windmills, is you're contributing to lowering the ability of the planet to sustain human life. So you cannot fight this policy if you are a so-called environmentalist. And the best thing for the environment is this is for us to continue the process of the way that the planet naturally developed, which is through our creativity, to develop ever more and more energy intense forms of idea. Now, the question is how, is, how is it possible? How is it made possible that we did this? And it's interesting, think about certain things, like the steam engine. I mean, that was an amazing thing. They, um, you know, the first time I think it was built in London, people came over here, Patterson, New Jersey, was the main place where we were producing the first steam engines. What did that allow our nation to do? And then you had coal, and you had, you could have people in upstate New York producing food, and the milk could be delivered to the doorstep of people in New York City the following day. I mean, these things are phenomenal breakthroughs, which happened because you had the mo uh, somebody made a discovery in their mind, but you had a nation, you had a society which wanted to spread these discoveries and incorporate it in improving the standard of living of the population. And what's fascinating, and this is the other thing to think about, essentially the argument of these environmentalists who say we have to reduce consumption would be to say, well, We've, we've already discovered everything. There's nothing more. We know everything. We've discovered everything that you could possibly know on the planet. And if we haven't figured it out, it's just one of those things we never will know. You know, like what Obama says about earthquakes. And we just never will know that. And we've reached the pinnacle. We've learned everything we can. Forget it. You will never make a new discovery. You're not going to learn something new today or tomorrow. You can just forget it. Uh, and that's it. I mean, imagine the arrogance of thinking that we are at the end of what we can discover about this, about the universe. And that's their axiom. So we're never going to come up with a more efficient form of energy. We're never going to solve the problem of nuclear waste. You know, which you already can recycle. I'm just sort of kidding. But I mean, just the idea um, that we stop, we stop here and there's nothing left to discover. And of course, that is what you see in Obama. And you have to think about it. What kind of person says, why should we go back to the moon? We've been there already. What is, that is an anti-human outlook. It is anti-human. So, um, 
I wanted to just review from our founding fathers. Uh, this is Alexander Hamilton. Can people see that somewhat? Yes. I'll read it. And this is from him on the subject of manufacturers. And he had a big fight back then because people didn't agree we should go into manufacturing. They said if you have manufacturing, that you'll have machines replacing human labor. Does that sound familiar? Yes. You'll have machines replacing human labor, labor and that's going to mean fewer jobs. And of course, Hamilton's point is if you have machines replacing human labor, then you have more space to develop your mind and you can have a greater division of labor which becomes more and more cognitive instead of physical. But the way he writes it, he says, to cherish and stimulate the activity of the human mind by multiplying the objects of enterprise is not among the least considerable of the expedients by which the wealth of a nation may be promoted. Even things in themselves not positively advantageous sometimes become so by the tendency to provoke exertion. Every new scene which is opened to the busy nature of man to rouse and exert itself is the addition of a new energy to the general stock of effort. Okay, so every new discovery, every new breakthrough furthers the potential for mankind to develop. And uh, you'll see last week, if you look at, um, not this past Wednesday, but the previous, the, the uh, weekly report with Lynn and Sky. There's a really um, delightful part where Sky talks about the evolution of birds and the question of feathers. Because it turns out that there were some dinosaurs that had feathers, but they were like really big and lunky. They were not able to fly, but they began the development of feathers. And the question is, well, what's the point of the feathers? And of course, all these silly, because our culture is so anti-scientific, so people have crazy ideas, and almost all of them have to do with sex, which is, you know, oh, well, the feathers make them more attractive for mating, or the feathers, you know. They have all these theories about the feathers. But the point is that at a certain point of the evolution, there were birds which had feathers which then could fly. So in the early phases of the feathers, they didn't really seem to have that much of a practical use, but they became something later. And in a sense, that's what Hamilton is, that's human economy, right? You don't know what a scientific discovery is going to mean in future generations where maybe the benefit of it at the moment is not obvious, but it, it becomes obvious and in that sense, the, the future changes the past because the past has a significance that it didn't have had you not made that breakthrough. Now, uh, we had also a, a great President Lincoln who was very clear on this, and I just found this, Keisha Rogers sent me part of the speech for my birthday some time ago, um, and it's an amazing speech. He's at a, uh, an agriculture festival in Milwaukee and actually he begins the speech by saying even he said I'm not here to flatter the farmers <laughs> he's addressing all the farmers it's just like Abraham Lincoln even though you you make up the biggest part of the American population that's not I'm not here to do that it's really it's funny but then he's he's going through and he's discussing the question of agriculture and you see how he thinks and it's exactly like LaRouche and it's exactly like what we're saying so he says my first suggestion is an inquiry as to the effect of greater thoroughness in all the departments of agriculture than now prevails in the Northwest, perhaps I might say America, to speak entirely within bounds. It is known that 50 bushels of wheat or 100 bushels of Indian corn can be produced from an acre. Less than a year ago, I saw it stated that a man, by extraordinary care and labor, had produced of wheat what was equal to 200 bushels from an acre. But take 50 of wheat and 100 of corn to be the possibility, and compare it with the actual crops of the country. Many years ago, I saw it stated in a patent office report 
that 18 bushels was the average crop throughout the United States. And this year, an intelligent framer, what should be farmer, I think, of Illinois, assured me that he did not believe the land harvested in that state this season had yielded more than an average of eight bushels to the acre. Much was cut and then abandoned is not worth threshing, and much was abandoned is not worth cutting. But is that, so you, he's looking at one acre where you're getting an average of 18 bushels and the potential that it could be 200. And that's with no, that's not increasing the land. That's not taking up more space. That's figuring out how to farm the land that you get the maximum output with the minimum amount of human labor. So he says, what would be the effect upon the farming interest to push the soil up to something near its full capacity? Unquestionably, it will take more labor to produce 50 bushels from an acre than it will to produce 10 bushels from the same acre. But will it take more labor to produce 50 bushels from one acre than that from five? Right, so you get the same amount of wheat in one acre as opposed to five acres. How much more work does that take? Unquestionably, thorough cultivation will require more labor to the acre, but will it require more to the bushel? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. That is the, that's the thinking of actual economics of the United States. And then, um, Let's see the Kennedy. Uh, I'll turn out the, you have the video? Okay, Bob's gonna show the video. Cause this, it really makes it very clear. Despite the striking fact that most of the scientists that the world has ever known are alive and working today, despite the fact that this nation's own scientific manpower is doubling every 12 years, in a rate of growth more than three times that of our population as a whole. Despite that, the vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. But condense, if you will, the 50,000 years of man's recorded history in a time span of about a half a century. Stated in these terms, we know very little about the first 40 years, except at the end of them, advanced man had learned to use the skins of animals to cover them. Then about 10 years ago, under this standard, man emerged from his caves to construct other kinds of shelter. Only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. Christianity began less than two years ago. The printing press came this year. And then less than two months ago, during this whole 50 year span of human history, the steam engine provided a new source of power. Newton explored the meaning of gravity. Last month, Electric lights and telephones and automobiles and airplanes became available. Only last week did we develop penicillin yeah. and television and nuclear power. And now if America's new spacecraft succeeds in reaching Venus, we will have literally reached the stars before midnight tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, anyway, so that is clearly, um, that's the American system. That's the American system of political economy. And you can see, if you think about uh, what has become of our country in the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination, and LaRouche has been talking a lot about the fact that you had him and then his brother killed, and you had the Warren Commission cover-up. So, it wasn't left open or ambiguous. It was clear that policy ended. 
And what you had then was the Congress of Cultural Freedom take over with the environmentalist movement, the rock, drug, sex, flower, children. You can't change the future. Worry about yourself. Don't think about that bumper sticker. Think globally, act locally, right? Just small, and it was the exact opposite. Here he is talking about, again, he gave you the sense of a hyperbolic function of the pace of human developments and breakthrough and discovery. And that's natural. And since that, the 60s, there has actually been an attack on this. And I want to say, um, it's one thing we're getting just before I get to the next um, point. You know, a lot of people say, well, uh, like there, I heard some press as all the markets were crashing and they were saying, well, is it going to be as bad as 2008? And of course, the point is, no, it's, this is the next step beyond 2008. This is the end. It's over. The system is over. As bad as 2008, it's over, right? And and it's not going to get better because people also think, well, it's going to get better. I mean, we're getting we're going to hit the bottom, and then it's going to get better. No, it's not going to get better because the policy of of the British Empire, the policy of the people who have done this to our nation is to destroy our nation. The intent is the destruction of the United States, which means the destruction of civilization, because what other nation on the planet had the commitment to human economy that coheres with the development of the biosphere? What you heard from Hamilton and from Lincoln and from Kennedy. So if you want to run an oligarchical system, if you want to run empire, then you destroy the United States. So it's not going to get better. There is no intent for it to get better. Obama's not trying to do his assignment, no matter, I don't know how clear he is, I think he's blinded by his ego, so I'm not sure how much he knows that he is a tool to destroy the United States. That's what he's doing. That's why LaRouche is saying there is no option other than removing him. Now, I want to, uh, Look at um, oh yeah we should we should do this just so you have it in mind um, the nature of this coup that Obama did with the Congress and the idea that they're going to vote themselves out of power and abrogate their responsibility and hand it off to some little group of twelve. I just thought I'd put up Article One, Section Eight, okay, of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, one, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United <laughs> States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Two, to borrow money on the credit of the United States. Three, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the states. Four to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies through the United States. Five, to coin money, regulate the value thereof. This is the Congress. This is the Congress, okay? Uh, and a foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures. Six, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. That could be useful today. Um, two is seven, to establish post offices and post roads. Eight, this is where the NASA, some of the astronauts are saying that Obama could be impeached just for shutting down the space program. To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discovery. Nine, to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Ten, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. Go on. Eleven, to declare war. That's another one where Obama is impeachable. Uh, grant letters of mark and reprisal and make rules concerning captures on land and water. Twelve, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. That's interesting. 13, to provide and maintain a navy. 14, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. 
15, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. 16, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining them. And remember, this is the Congress. This is the Congress. And for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states, respectively, the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to discipline prescribed by Congress. To exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square, that's now Washington, D.C., as may by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of the government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be in for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings and to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper, that's the clause that Garrett wants to get rid of, um, for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. So this is what the US Congress is supposed to be responsible for. Now the Federal Reserve is a private bank, so that's a violation. But what they just did with assigning a super Congress and saying we're taking away, we're gonna vote ourselves out of Power, and we're going to give our authority to these 12 ubermensch, and they're going to decide so we can keep our hands clean as we decide that we're going to crush the American, we're going to crush the population, we're going to increase the death rate in total violation of the way that the planet naturally would develop. We're going to increase the death rate so that we can give money to people at Goldman Sachs and Royal Bank of Scotland and the institutions that actually destroy the United States. We're gonna make sure that they get bailed out while we kill off our own population. Now, um, what happened in Germany, the parallel is what happened with the Reichstag, which was they were holding elections, I think they were supposed to be March 5th or 6th, in 1933. And they wanted they banned the they wanted to ban the Communist Party. So what happened is Hitler's guy Goering burned they burned down the Parliament. They did it themselves, the famous Reichstag fire. And then they said we're under attack. The Communists are invading. The Communists have attacked us. And this was the pretext for later with what was called the Ermächtigung Gesetz or the enabling. Act, which was where the Reichstag decided that they would vote democratically to give Hitler dictatorial power. And the various parties, a few people had been arrested, the most outspoken ones were arrested, so they weren't there to vote. But the other ones were very pragmatic. They said, well, let's work with Hitler. We can, if we do what he wants, he'll work with us and we'll have a deal. So we'll try and bring him in by doing what he wants. So they voted that given that it was an emergency, the parliament having to go through all these parliamentary procedures could really be a drag. So they would give Hitler dictatorial powers. And after that, they only met, I think, 12 times in 12 years. And the only reason they ever met was to renew the dictatorship. So that's what was done. So you think about that, and you think about what, what our US Congress um, has just done, and it is almost identical. It is precisely identical. Okay, for all those people who said, how can you put that mustache on Obama? Isn't that over the top? Well, actually, no, because if the United States goes fascist, a lot more people are going to be killed than Hitler even dreamed of killing because you're going to have billions of people dead all over the planet if the United States goes fascist and many millions in the United States. It doesn't take that long if you don't have clean water, you don't have basic infrastructure, you have starvation. What happens if you get a disease in the middle of that? You just have people dropping like flies. That's what happens in places like Africa. Everybody's already so weak from malnutrition. You get a disease and you just wipe out, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people 
That's what a dark age looks like. So um, that's why we are saying that the two things that have to be done immediately are Obama's removal from office. It's not negotiable, it's a necessity. And the question of Glass-Steagall, because what the Glass-Steagall Act does, what FDR did when he passed it was he was going back to Hamilton. Because the Glass-Steagall Act says the money is not, the value is not in the money. The value is in where, where are we gonna be 50 years from now? Where are we gonna be 100 years from now? Can we use our money as an instrument of credit to ensure that we have a larger population with a higher standard of living, as is the natural way for human beings and the planet to develop 50 years from now and 100 years from now? And so by protecting the commercial banking system, which is the way the credit is allocated, and just saying all this gambling debt, people betting on mortgage-backed securities and credit default options and all this gobbledygook garbage, let it go. And you know what? You can ask yourself this for all those people say, well, the first bailout really was necessary. How many people in this room have heard that? Well, the first bailout was necessary, right? Everyone's heard that. Yeah. yeah. Well, why? Tell, how has Wall Street going up? Wall Street went up. That's really great. Now, has that helped you, your neighbor? Do we have more police on the streets? Do we have cleaner drinking water because we saved Wall Street? How about more health care? Do they build more public hospitals with all that benefit? No. So, so the stock market went up and the standard of living went down. So none of the bailouts was necessary, including the first one, none of them. They didn't help anyone. They made everyone's life worse. And you can think conversely, if Wall Street crashed, if the market crashed, unless someone jumped out of a window, they would, people are not going to die. We will be relatively not affected by a crash of the markets if we have Glass-Steagall in effect and if we are building infrastructure and organizing a recovery. And what I just wanted to look at um, in closing is that people know, because this really, it just struck me as I was thinking this thing through about this NAWAPA project, the North American Water and Power Lines, how much this is absolutely fits the bill for what we should be doing right now. And for people, for a quick review, this area, Alaska, um, Canada and Alaska up here, about 50% of the rainfall in our hemisphere lands up there. And it just, the clouds just kind of hit the mountains, rain and the water just washes off into the Pacific and Arctic Ocean and it never gets used and it's very good fresh water. So the idea is to take just 20%, divert it down into the Rocky Mountain Trench and also over here in Idaho and what you can do is irrigate, for one thing, this whole desert region. And this has big implications because one of the reasons why you get really extreme weather, I mean, everyone knows from the Weather Channel that when you have a hot front and it hits a cold front and, and you get thunderstorms, you get a tornado or whatever. So the more extreme difference in temperature, the more likely the weather is to be violent. If you're irrigating the desert, you're lowering the temperature. If you're planting trees and particularly leafy types of vegetables, and people who've researched this know better than I do, but there are certain types of vegetables where the plants um, expire much more water. So you change the whole climate. So what happens? The, the hot areas become more moderate. And this sort of thing, particularly if we also were doing it in Africa, you would actually change the weather. You wouldn't have these extreme temperature fronts coming together in the way that they do now. And, and we don't know all of this because, frankly, we haven't been doing any research since Kennedy was assassinated. We began taking down the space program. But what little you do know, you can hypothesize that it would have, you know, extremely beneficial effects way beyond what we even know about, which is that you could grow a lot more food and, and have water. You wouldn't have to have fights between the farmers and the cities on California over who gets the water. And doing this would create about 7 million jobs. 
And I just wanted to put up, I had everyone, I, I asked Jerry to give everyone a handout, which just goes through what it entails. But this is just the bill of materials for some of it. And it's really fun to think about how you're going to come up with this. Hundreds of millions of sacks of cement, 100 million tons of steel, tens of millions of tons of copper and aluminum, and a vast array of new machinery to construct the project and move approximately 32 billion cubic yards of earth, which have to be moved. Uh, drilling 50 tunnels with a total distance of over 1,000 miles and displacing 860 cubic yards of solid rock. Uh, using an unprecedented number of tunnel board machines and new techniques and then an undefined quantity of orders for the production of heavy electrical equipment involved in power generation stations, including four bay penstocks, head gates, I don't know what any of these things are, turbine wheels, now maybe you do, <laughs> generating units, switch gear, and then pumping stations, large motors, large capacity pumps, valving, fittings, intake. So you can imagine, what, what did Long Island do? What was produced on Long Island for the space program? A lot, a lot. Okay, New Jersey has like a zillion machine tool shops that are closed down. All of these things would have to be put into high gear, into massive production, because the hub of the, the project for the US is Idaho. I mean, what's in Idaho? I think it has like five people, yeah, potatoes. You know, it's sort of like when the Hoover Dam was built. There was nothing, there was nothing out there. They had to build new cities and, you know, so what you're talking about with Nawaba is you'd spend five years just building the rail network. Just building the railroads that you could get all this stuff out to Idaho and the other places we're going to be building it, which means the whole East Coast Corridor, Baltimore, you know, Sparrow Point, the whole um, Pennsylvania with all the rail and industry that they had, Ohio, New Jersey, New York, Long Island, Boston, the high tech, all of this stuff would be immediately, we'd have to mobilize it. And the other thing that's really pressing, aside from the fact that we're about to have a dark age, um, is that a lot of the people who know how to do these things, these really highly skilled, they're like 70 years old now because we haven't built anything in 35, 40 years. So the people with the hands-on experience who we're gonna, we're gonna have to put all these young people into apprenticeship programs and get them trained and the guys with the hands-on experience are all over 70. We're going to have to quickly get them away from Obama's health care plan <laughs> and, get them, uh, and get them into work um, to, to help, you know, train these young people and build this thing. But you can see, I was so struck when I looked at this because it's so massive. It exactly fulfills what you're looking at where you want to increase your consumption and your productivity exponentially. <coughs> And that's why only something like this will work. We're beyond, you cannot fix a bridge and save the economy that is not gonna do it. Filling one pothole in New York might be close to the equivalent of Nawapa. <laughs> but um, <laughs> some, uh, some of the ones that I've seen. But anyway, that will do it. So last slide. Um, anyway, so that's, that's what I had to present. Uh, I think Stephanie will come up and we can take some questions, but I, I would urge everyone here, we're gonna discuss at the end these sheets and what you're gonna do to help us remove Obama and get Glass-Steagall in place. Thank you.